Welcome back, everybody. I'm Giles, and welcome to the show. And today, we've got one that I think is going to be absolutely stupendous. This is really cool. So I have two gentlemen joining me today that I have heard of and, and been a fan of for many, many years. And if you're a home theater aficionado, if you like cinema, you probably have heard of, of them as well. You know, they produce the Spears and Muscle set of discs that people use to do all kind of cool things with their systems. And today they're here. They're, that's right. You're looking at them with your eyes and you're going to get to hear directly from them about their cool new set of discs that they have out. And we're going to get to that. But first, Don, Stacy, welcome to the show, gentlemen. So happy to have you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Now, it might be possible that we have one or two people out there that are not familiar with you and your work. So I think to kick things off, let's talk a little bit about you gentlemen, who you are, and then we can get into a little bit about, you know, the collaboration and the products that you have built uh, over the years. So um, just on my screen, Don, you're at the top. So we'll start with you for no particular reason. Uh, okay. Um... <laughs> uh, no, I know I'm the spot now. <laughs> <laughs> Stacy and I are both software engineers uh, who were working at Microsoft some years back, and we're both video aficionados and basically film buffs. We both got into video because we wanted to see films looking better at home. You know, the kind of people who uh, bought a laserdisc player when it was, you know, the hot, the new hotness, right? And uh, you know, we met at Microsoft, we're working in different groups and we just hit it off and we started working on uh, collaborating on articles for a few different places, but mostly uh, it, about DVD players and uh, about, you know, TVs and stuff. And over time, this led to us writing code to do different things like um, create test patterns and uh, write test scripts and, you know, like dig, dig into the details of how DVDs are encoded and stuff like that. And um, yeah, just over time, we started making more and more test patterns and people wanted us to make test patterns, wanted us to do something different, you know, add something that wasn't on the existing test pattern disks. And yeah, you know, the rest is history. The rest is four different Spears and Munsell, you know, calibration and test disks. That's cool. So Stacy, anything to add on to that from your point of view? Any of the deep, dark secrets that Don might have walked <laughs> over? <laughs> Too no, much that, there. That one time you went to work for Novell or something? No, no Novell for us. Yeah. Although we right both on. did eventually leave Microsoft after, what, 15, 16 years. So. Yeah. Right on. And so I guess uh, what you touched on there really is the meat of the conversation today. And that's the, you know, the spears and muscle discs, right, that have come out over time. And we're on the, uh, I think you said the fourth generation of discs. Um, let's talk a little bit about those and what people use them for. So for the person that might not have seen them before, uh, but is, uh, you know, a, a fan of home theater, and that could be anywhere from kind of entry level up to, you know, super enthusiast, you know, what, what do the discs do? What are they for? Why would someone be interested in them? Stacy, you want to take that since I've just been talking? Sure. Uh, so actually, we originally started, I think our first disc came out around 2008. And Oppo was the company that actually pushed us to do our first disc. They came to us and said, hey, we want you to make a disc that uh, it's okay if it breaks us. We'll fix anything that it breaks. We want you to put a calibration disc out there that's you know fairly inexpensive. And for Blu-ray, because at the time, HD DVD Blu-ray had just come out. And Joe Kane had done LaserDisc, DVD, and I think maybe HD, HD DVD at the time. This was the first time doing Blu-ray. So that was our first disc. And the initial disc was really very simple. It was all about what can you do without having any test, in test instruments, no colorimeters or anything else. And so at the most basic level, it's about video setup, uh, how to adjust the front, pack, front panel picture controls on your television. And then it sort of grew from there. But that now, is the, I, oh. I would assume that, you know, as the generations have moved along and technology has progressed, the discs have become more sophisticated just to keep up with all of the different technology that's out there. Is that correct? Yeah. The, the, we've gotten requests from various companies to add test patterns that will interface well with their test equipment. We've gotten requests from calibrators, professional calibrators to do tests that'll make their calibrations easier, to arrange tests in ways that make their calibrations easier. 
We've gotten requests from people who evaluate professionally and you know, people who write about video and audio who want certain kind of test patterns that they don't have on other discs. And so, and we generally are open to that. Our feeling is, you know, like, sure, we'll get it into the next, next disc. And uh, we've had manufacturers ask us to generate test patterns. Uh, I think the best story there is one large manufacturer that you would know and once asked us to make a test pattern that would showcase a flaw in their competitor's product. <laughs> That's awesome. And we were like, hmm, could we also make something that showcases a flaw in the, uh, you know, could we like go to lots of manufacturers and say, how would you like us to make <laughs> patterns that showcase flaws in your competitor's product? And eventually we'd collect them all and everybody would look bad. But but um, I think to further answer your, your question, the first disc was simply 2D HD resolution. The second disc added 3D capability. The third and fourth disc added UHD capability with HDR. So I think the first, our last yeah. disc had just HDR10. The new disc has HDR10, Dolby Vision, and HDR10+. Plus. So is is 3D really relevant, relevant today uh, on a mass market <laughs> level? Come on, let's, we can get into this war. Come on, I, I, I just said Don the bomb for you. Stacy has to answer that because it's I'm a, not. It's a trap. <laughs> yes. It's a trap. Oh! Uh, I love 3D. I take 3D pictures with my extensive collection of 3D cameras. So I still like 3D. But commercially, no, 3D is not super relevant, certainly not in the home. Um, Bryce is like, Don loves 3D. Yes, I do. I do. I don't actually take most other you know like i just we just went on a trip to europe and i took like 500 3d pictures and like a few dozen with my camera just because it's a lot harder to share 3d pictures you know in a text message or you know mm -hmm. on facebook or something so um yeah i let my wife take all the flat pictures as we 3d aficionados call it but the flat yeah. pictures i love it yeah. you know there was a phone that had a 3d screen on it an auto stereoscopic screen yes produced by the company that stacy works for well, well, that's it's more awesome. of a sister company, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll put a link down to that below. So for those of you that are interested in like, <laughs> oh, it what is this other conversation, <laughs> we we can you know, that'll be the gateway into that stuff. And you know, sure. that's, um, not to take away from this discussion, but that's you know screens now that are what is the correct term? Audio auto stereoscopic, right? Mm. Um, I'm seeing those things come out now. You know, laptops with a uh, non visual aid 3D screen, and they were a lot at CES. So cool stuff, but another topic for another day um so now we're on version four who is your target audience who who would you say is going to be like i have to have these discs and and they go out and get them right who, who is that audience i would say anyone with a 4k blu-ray player at this point given how small the market has become <laughs> <laughs> that's another big topic of discussion i released a video about that and people went absolutely nuts about it it was pretty awesome um, but uh, so it, it really is anyone that's got a 4K player in a display of any kind can get value out of these discs, right? Right, because if you've got a 4K Blu-ray player, that means you actually love movies. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't you probably wouldn't have the player. So that yeah. that makes that makes a lot of sense. Now, um, so you know, when I think of myself personally, uh, and for everybody that's watching, I'm going to follow up this video with uh, uh, you know a number of pieces of content that leverage the new set of discs. Um, to uh, to see how working as a layperson, right? So I'm going to try and put myself into the, a situation where you know I say, okay, I don't know anything about anything. Let's what can I do with these discs to improve the the system? I'm going to do this both for uh, television and for projection, uh, and and step that step people through what it's like to experience it. Um, what would you say most people experience like on the on the tail end of that? Uh, would you say that most everybody when they pop these discs in and they go through the different screens and they follow the the script, they end up with a system that's going to give them a, a, a definitively improved experience is, or is it something that's minor or are people going to be shocked or does it really depend on the system? So I would say it depends it, on the system. So it'll give you an accurate image, but sometimes initially seeing an accurate image uh, is a negative because it's not as colorful as it is when it comes out of the box. Not as sharp, not as bright, not as colorful. Not as super saturated or oversaturated. <laughs> yeah. I would also say that um, if you're an aficionado and you've already set a lot of things to, to reasonable values, you know, like if you take a, a screen that's um, just straight from the factory or straight from, you know, 
you've never done anything to it. When it comes out of the box, it's a bunch of modes are going to be set poorly. And right. just getting everything set up properly is going to make a pretty big difference in terms of the quality of the image. Although, as Stacey says, you know, that may not be as bright. It may not be as colorful because it's what it's supposed to look like, not like hypersaturated. Um, so somebody who's already done a bunch of that kind of got their TV into sort of the basically right modes and so forth. I'm not sure that they're going to see as big an, uh, a, an improvement as somebody who's taking something right out of the box. I think that the satisfaction comes from understanding what stuff does and understanding, yeah. you know, why is this setting here? What does it do? You know, I, you can go through the patterns and turn that setting off and on, and you can really see visually what is this doing? Or you can see that none of the patterns change in any visible way, in which case it's like, it doesn't do anything. And you may think, well, that doesn't ever happen, does it? And the answer is actually, uh, you know, we occasionally see settings on TVs where we think, is this actually hooked up to anything? Because we can't find anything that it does. But The placebo control. Yeah. And, and there's things like sharpening. A lot of settings actually on TVs now are sharpening and noise reduction settings. They sometimes have four or five different switches, settings, sliders that effectively sharpen or reduce noise and reducing noise and sharpening are kind of you know a lot of the algorithms kind of pull against each other like sometimes when you reduce noise you tend to reduce detail or sharpness you know it's very difficult mm -hmm. to tell the difference between noise and fine detail so trying to find the right balance between those the nice thing is having a test pattern that can really show you what's changing as you move these things around is really useful because sharpening and noise reduction are kind of set um subjectively this is not something where there is an objective standard it depends on you right. your system your lighting system your p viewing position the specific technology involved so you really do need test patterns to set that as best you can i mean you can just kind of eyeball it with content you like that's okay but we definitely believe that doing it with test patterns and really understanding what's changing as you move those sliders around you turn those features off and on um, it's really useful. It's really useful. I, I think that that's in the modern era, that's probably the most useful part of the disc for your average consumer is just being able to turn on and off these various, you know, reality creation and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like edge enhancement and various other modes and really see what they're doing to the image. People glibly say, oh, just turn all that off, turn all of that off. And that's not a wrong choice, but in some cases, some of these things actually do something useful because sharpness is perceptual, right? I mean, there isn't a specific industry standard for sharpness um, because there really can't be. You really want the image to be as sharp as it can be without having distracting artifacts. And that's really, that's something that you have to evaluate with your eyes and your brain. And, and sometimes sharpness controls don't have an off position. They have a negative position. So right. turning it down too far starts to soften the image. That's right. Yeah. Also on the disc, so we have demonstration material available in all the different HDR formats and SDR. So if you're curious, well, what's the difference between Dolby Vision or HDR10 or SDR or HLG? You can compare them all and see the difference. Yeah. The that same content. Valuable. Yeah. Mastered by the same people color time by the same people like they're all designed to look as close as possible but in fact they can't be you know like the dolby vision one does look different from the hdr10 because there just are certain limitations that mean you can't make one look exactly like the other and it is interesting to look at it and see what's blown out in this one or what has more detail in this version or you know, it's really, I think, a great thing if you're trying to decide, you know, is it worth it to me to have, you know, Dolby Vision or is HDR10 Plus really give add value over HDR10? I think you can answer those questions. So one thing that I have a lot of people over time come to me and, and say is, you know, they'll, they'll say, you know, I want to buy a television or I want to buy a projector, but I don't really know what it should look like. They, they have no idea. And then the next questions are, and I don't know what a gamma is, and I don't know what blooming is, and I don't know what crush is, and I don't know what saturation is, and I don't know any of that stuff, right? So what I end up doing is I just take it out of the box and just look at it, and it is what it is. This tool set 
would be very educational for a person in that situation. Would you say? Oh, we hope Absolutely. so. Yeah, but that's <laughs> that's that's the target. Those, those are the ones. Yeah. That's what we are trying to do. And also a jumping off point, like this is not a complete course in video knowledge, but hopefully it gives you some tools that combined with your research, with reading books, reading articles, watching, um, you know, YouTube shows and so forth. You know, you can go back, take these test patterns, put them up and go, oh, now I see what they were talking about. You know, you can see bloom. You can see uh, what happens when blacks get crushed, when whites get crushed. You know, you can you can recreate these things yourself on the screen with the controls. You can deliberately crush whites, deliberately crush blacks, see what it does to the image. It's, um, you know, it, it's hopefully a really great tool. Hopefully the Swiss Army knife of, you know, uh, understanding video you can uh, go as deep as you want basically. yeah absolutely <laughs> now we i think we've really been talking a lot about colors and sharpness and that kind of thing um do the discs have any functionality around screen geometry yes oh yeah yeah because i uh I, i'm afflicted with uh, some fairly bad geometry from a you know fixed anamorphic lens <laughs> you know so uh, I, I forget what the correct term i don't know if it's barrel or pincushion or whatever but uh you know you can you can definitely see the the, the bottom and the top getting a little fun action there so mm -hmm. so some some help along those lines as well yeah there, there's that there's also aspect ratio patterns for people with different uh fixed screens or different masking systems so you can see how different. Yeah. So you can see what 2.39 to one, you know, where that falls on the screen, 1.6 to 1, 1.77 to 1, and so forth. Uh 1.33. Uh, all those different aspect ratios if you're trying to set up, you know, get your electrical masking system set up properly. You can also, you know, put up geometry patterns that allow you to measure exactly how far off are various parts of the screen. And as you adjust things, you can start to figure out, okay, well, do, this adjustment is moving this, this way, you know, you can actually get out there with a ruler and measure the grid and so forth. So, yeah. And, there, and there, both the aspect ratio and geometry have circles in the middle and in the corner. So you can see if they're actually round in all parts of the screen. That's that's awesome. Yeah. So I I want to shift gears a little bit, right, and move away from, uh, kind of say the the layperson, right, and and talk a little bit more in the professional realm, right. So uh, maybe you have someone who is an enthusiast that really wants to kind of go next level, and they want to buy some additional tools, and and they want to get as much out of their system as possible, right. They're like, I want this thing to be perfect right when when i see a color i want that to be the real exact color how how what might that work with your set of discs so that's typically done in combination with both software a colorimeter and then window test patterns the idea okay. is you'll use the software that controls the colorimeter to measure the different window test patterns you've got grayscale patterns and you've got color patterns okay and in modern day a lot of that is done with a, like a 3d lut and so you might have an a lut is a uh, look up table. Look up table. Mm -hmm. that it's, <laughs> I mean, it's pretty boring, you know, it's a lookup it table. Fancy. Yeah. It's basically a big array of, you know, when this value comes in, output this value. And if a value comes in in between values in the lookup table, it interpolates, it just averages, usually just by linear averaging. It just says, what are the nearest points in the lookup table? We'll average that together and we'll spit that out. And, um, Lookup tables turn out to be a great way to, um, you know, really dial in specific color accuracy. You get certain key colors accurate, perfectly accurate, absolutely spot on, and then interpolate any colors that are near them. And usually you can get the entire color space to within very small deltas of where it's supposed to be. Um, so there are specific boxes that have, you know, like fancy lookup tables. Most, um, Televisions have lookup tables, and if you can get into the service menu, you can often, you know, load a whole new lookup table. And a lot of calibration nowadays is, in fact, generating a custom lookup table that gets loaded into your TV, and then, you know, all your colors are as absolutely as close as they possibly can be. And for the real serious aficionado, you know, buying a TV that has a fancier lookup table, a larger lookup table, a more elaborate interpolation method, things like that, that's, that's one of the ways that people with really high-end systems get them extra 
are dialed in. And yes, this disk is in fact all the key test patterns that you will need in combination with you know, calibration software, colorimeter, and so forth to, um, you know, to generate that lookup table. Right on. Now, this might be a little off topic, um, but one thing that I have a lot of people ask me about is, uh, you know, the different flavors of HDR, right? You know, Dolby Vision, HDR10 plus whatnot, um, and then SDR, right? And how can they decide, you know, how they should consume content? You know, is it is it just based off of the capabilities of their equipment? And if so, can they use your test patterns to look at what their equipment is capable of doing and kind of decide what the best way to view things on their system might be? So that's part of where the demonstration material comes in, because we offer the same exact piece of content. It was mastered in HDR and SDR separately. And then it was uh, output to both Dolby Vision, HDR10, 10, 10 plus, HDR10 at different nit levels or peak brightness levels. And uh, so you can compare the content and see how it looks in all the different modes. But there are all the test patterns exist in all the modes as well to evaluate the performance. Something that I think is worth saying right now is that we're still kind of in the early days of HDR. And as a result, um, the studios, when they produce a disc, or an HDR master for streaming for that matter, they tend to be really conservative with the HDR because they don't really want it to look drastically different between say Dolby Vision and HDR 10 and HDR 10 plus. So the net result is that they tend to go for a least common denominator approach. Like on this disc, we deliberately chose to push the envelope as far as possible. So it represents, you know, like this is, using every feature we can on Dolby Vision. This is using everything we can with HDR10, HDR10+. Plus. This is pushing things way out into the, into the higher ranges of HDR. Really bright content, uh, really high contrast in one scene. And in a lot of movies, they could, excuse me, they could do that. They choose not to, you know, like, they want there to be some HDR content, but they don't want it to look so radically different on different displays that um, it's a problem for them, you know, because there's so many different displays and so many different mm -hmm. parameters and so forth. They want to make sure that it looks pretty good on all of them. So there's quite a few HDR discs and it varies somewhat, you know, everybody's got slightly different standards, but there are quite a few of them where the HDR is only a little bit more dynamic range than the SDR version. Or it's more numerically, but visually it's not as big a difference. And people, you know, you see lots of people commenting on that. They say, oh, I looked at the HDR version, didn't look that much different from the SDR. Um, that's kind of true. You could actually measure the numbers and you'd almost always find that they, you know, they're using the HDR range. It's just that to see big differences, you have to use really, really big dynamic range differences. Your your eye is not the best evaluator of exactly how much contrast there is in an image you're seeing, unless you're seeing them side by side, in which case sometimes, you know, you look at the HDR version, the SDR version, you're like, oh my God, that's hugely different. But right. with time delay, you can watch an SDR version and then watch an HDR version of the same thing. And even with 10 minutes, 20 minutes later, it may not be really obvious to your eye that you're looking at a lot more contrast on the screen or you're looking at a lot brighter image. It's, you know, you're trying to remember, what did that look like 10 minutes ago versus what am I looking at right now? To really evaluate, you often have to do it side by side. Um, or you need to have really radical differences, which is, you know, hopefully what, what you will see with our disc. So this will show you what the potential is and what the most aggressive HDR is going to look like. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to buy an HDR version of your favorite movie and it's going to look radically different from the SDR version of your favorite movie. That's down to what the mastering people decided to do with that movie. And they may have been somewhat more conservative than they could have been, <laughs> which of course will lead to a whole new round of remastered movies in the future as they say, oh, now that televisions can put out, you know, whatever, 2,000, 4,000 nits or whatever, they may remaster the movies to an even higher, you know, to, to allow for more uh, HDR um, range. Um, we'll right. see so about we that. Yeah, so we actually mastered out to the full spec of HDR because HDR basically looked forward. Instead of having a standard that was, you know, for yesterday, they created a standard for tomorrow. 
So 10 years from now, you could play our disc. And if you've got a new 10,000 hit display, it'll look a lot different than it does today. Yeah. yeah, that's like a supernova, though. 10,000 nits. It seems like that's pretty bright, right? So if you look at a full moon at night, it's 4,000 nits. Okay. Hey, see, that's a good comparison. Yeah. So that's more than twice as bright as a, a full moon. I mean, a bright, sunny day, you know, is quite bright. You know, you look at yeah, like... 20, 30,000 nits easily outside on yeah. the sidewalk. So... You, and, you know, so that's pretty blown out. Like it's, but if you transition and I've actually seen this, you know, Stacy and I were at Dolby and they did a demo for us of like a guy is in a cave and it's got all the detail. It's very dim and he's moving through the cave and you can see quite well because it's bright enough to see by and your eyes are fully adjusted. And then he walks out of the cave into bright desert sunlight and everyone in the room went, oh my goodness, whoa. <laughs> You know, it was like, oh, it's a visceral experience of walking out of a dark cave and into the sunlight. I mean, we've all had that experience. It's exactly the experience you would have if you were there. And Dolby is like, see? Ah? Ah? <laughs> there's, a local, there's a local movie theater here that it's, you know, once you come out of the movie and you go outside, it just it's painful on the eyes. It takes so long to compensate. That's 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 awesome. Um, so one other, I think, X, Y, Z question for you guys um, that I've had a lot of people pose to me. Um, when you think about equipment that uh, that does tone mapping, right? So, you know, like the Panasonic disc players and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, how do you feel that that fits in to, you know, the ecosystem of picture quality? Is that a, a very desirable product set? Does it work well with your discs? Or is that really just kind of a Band-Aid that, you know, in, in a, a hack, not really hack, but just a feature set that's not super valuable? Or, or is that something that that is, is a valuable tool set that we would expect to see to get better over time? So it can be valuable. So Dolby Vision is a standard, and they have the same tone mapping on every display. So the tone mapping that's in the Panasonic player is not applied. But for HDR10, there's mm -hmm. no standard. So every manufacturer is just doing what they think is the right thing to do. And it's like Don said, it's the early days. So they're all learning. So Dolby created the HDR format, and they're probably five to 10 years ahead of everyone else. Like their tone mapping, even in the current older tone mapping, is still better than what everybody has today. So, right. and that's all dynamic. Where the Panasonic is a static curve. Some displays have static, some have dynamic. And every year they become better and better. Yeah, I mean, you have to do some kind of tone mapping because there's no way to map HDR to all these different displays that have different physical characteristics. Um, so they all have to have some, some some kind of tone mapping, and that can just be a simple shoulder curve, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that you know it it can be um, a more sophisticated curve. It can depend on you know, the stats that are listed in the video file, some of them kind of ignore that and say, you know what, the stats are often wrong or they're often misleading. So we're just going to kind of ignore that. Um, you know, the best ones, I think, take it, take into account the content that they're looking at. Like you have to have some kind of tone mapping curve, like HDR kind of requires it. So, um, and yeah, it's... So dynamic tone, dynamic tone mapping would probably be the holy grail. The problem is, is when they use that to sort of alter the artistic intent. So, mm. for example, on our disc, we have a bunch of skin tone content, a bunch of models standing uh, next to a color checker chart. And on that chart is a white square, and that white square should measure 134 nits. So if you look at an LG display in, in static mode, it's 134 nits. If you turn on their dynamic tone mapping, it's over 200 nits. So they're literally altering wow. levels down low. They're raising them up. So they shouldn't do that. There's also this thing that, you know, they, they're trying to sell TVs. I know this is a shocker to everybody. <laughs> what? No. I know. They're they don't a want poor it to look profit bright business. compared to others. Yeah. So it's it's really tempting. And I think the temptation is too great to ignore to, to uh, adjust your tone mapping so that your TV looks different from the TVs next to it, right? Um, hopefully better, but often different is really just the key thing. They want people to be able to look at it and go, oh yeah, I love LG or I love Sony yeah. and it looks different from the ones next to it. So that helps justify like, this is why I'm not buying this El Cheapo TV. I'm buying a real Sony or I'm buying this fancy LG OLED. It looks different. And of course, the goal of you know calibration is to not is to make things look 
as close to the same as possible. But the goal of the TV manufacturers is, again, shocker, to sell TVs. And this has always been the case. Um, you know, calibration is kind of working against the incentives of the TV manufacturers. So the compromise that I think most of the TV manufacturers have come to is out of the box, they all look different. So if some random schmo sets them up at you know, Best Buy mm -hmm. or Costco or something, they all look different and they all look super bright and super colorful. And they're in their, whatever their default mode is, normal or vivid or whatever. If you get them home and put them into cinema or filmmaker or whatever the mode is that they have on them that is designed for more uh, aficionados or something, they tend to look more similar. They're still not gonna look exactly the same, but they're gonna look similar. And again, and, with no standard for tone mapping. There is no right or wrong. There's just yeah, different. Yeah, there isn't a standard. Yeah, so you you can't say that it's wrong to roll the curve off more sharply. Um, that's their decision. They're trying to make it. They're trying to do a decent job of balance, balancing keeping the mid tones, you know, while also keeping as much detail in the highlights as possible. But I would argue raising my 134 nits to over yeah, 200 is wrong. Yeah. yeah. The midtones should really come out accurately. I mean, that's the. the I Anything think that's, within the display's native capability should not be touched, except for right the part near. Where it starts to roll off, yeah. Right near the roll off, yeah. right, and some have decided to start the roll off earlier than others. Like you figure that if a display can go from zero to a thousand nits, let's say, then you'd expect that z somewhere in the neighborhood of zero to nine hundred nits should really be displayed accurately. Like if the if the content calls for 750 nits, it should be as close as that display can do to 750 nits. But if the content is calling for 2000 nits, well, obviously the content can't, you know, the display can't do that. It's got to roll it off, right? It's got to like move it into the range that it can display. And hard clipping looks terrible. If you just say, we're going to display everything from zero to a thousand perfectly, and one thousand one and above is just gets displayed at one thousand. That looks terrible. Like all you just it just turns into this big flat white, and that's not good. So in that so, case, they'd probably start tone mapping on probably around five or six hundred nits to do a softer, gentler roll off. Right, and so figuring out where do you start your roll off, how gentle should it be? Should it be a fairly sharp roll off? Should it be a very gentle roll off? Do you eventually start hard clipping at some point? You know, like at some point you kind of say, man, if we're trying to get 5,000 nit content and still retain detail and get it mapped into this very small space we've got left over way at the top of our range, this is just a lost cause. At some point, you got to clip. And the, all those decisions are exactly what they're doing. They're looking at tons of content, and they're mostly looking at the content that the studios produce. So there is a certain chicken and egg problem here. If the studios never master for anything higher than you know, 2,000 nits, then the TV manufacturers are never going to tune their tone mapping algorithms for anything higher than 2,000 nits. And then the studios are like, well, everything above 2,000 nits gets clipped, so there's no point in generating anything above 2,000 nits. And eventually, we supposedly have a 10,000 nit HDR standard, but in practice, everybody's only using the first 2,000 nits. And we've seen this before with other things in video, where technically it has this huge capacity, but practically people only use these very constrained... Uh, sub parts because that's what they can guarantee will work. And I think that this is to some extent, this disc is our stab at saying, look, here is some real content that really goes all the way out to 10,000 nits. Your tone mapping algorithm should not make this look like crap. Right? <laughs> right <on>. That's, <laughs> that's it. basically it is we're like, it shouldn't look like crap, right? It should go, it goes to 10,000 nits, make it not look like crap. And that's hard. That's not a simple thing to do, but you know we're trying to push the envelope here. So I would add that Sony has probably made the most popular HDR grading monitor. And up until this year, it's been a thousand nits. Uh, this year at NAB, which is a trade show in Vegas every April, they introduced a 4,000 nit monitor and that's replacing the 1,000 nit monitor. So we might actually start to see brighter content coming. Wow, that's exciting. That's yeah. super cool. Yeah. I, I, I just hope that that, uh, that display would make the last episode of Game of Thrones a little more watchable. <laughs> <laughs> Game of Thrones, are we talking about the new series or the old series? <laughs> oh, the, the original, the last yeah. one, where it was like a black screen on for most people. They're like, what are they doing? Yeah. So, so 
House so of the in- Dragons. There were several scenes that, like on our on our TV, it was just like blackness with an occasional like shadow moving around. <laughs> it was just crazy. So one thing about you know the display tech, the Sony display is it can't fix the story, so it can't really make the story better on Game of Thrones. Some sharp criticism, here, <laughs> and gentlemen. Sharp criticism. So one of the episodes a lot of people complained about, they watched an SDR, and what Sony or at the time HBO, everything was graded on a two point two gamma. Uh, and so that means it comes out of black faster. So if you're watching with a 2.4 gamma, as most people calibrate to, then it's going to be even more crushed. Uh, so. Sure. So right that on. episode is even darker because of that. There All right. So on, on that large disappointment, we will move toward the end <laughs> of the episode. Uh, <laughs> um, gentlemen, um, I always like to close with if someone wanted to get their hands on this set of discs, how can they get their own copy? Where do they go? What do they do? So you can go to our website and then there's links to different dealers on there and where to buy it. So Spears and Munsell.com all spelled out. All right, everybody. You heard it. And it is Take available on Amazon. No, this one's not out. on Amazon. It's not on Amazon. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not on Amazon. No. Well, never mind. Don't go to Amazon. Whatever you do. For God's <laughs> sake. Don't do it. <laughs> They've only got the bad stuff. Good stuff is on their website. Links below, everybody. Um, Don Stacy. It has been a pleasure having you gentlemen on the show. Um, I've wanted to meet you for a long time, so I'm really happy to have this opportunity. And I'm sure everybody else out there watching is happy to, to listen to you talk as well. So thank you. Thank you for having pleasure us. Pleasure was ours. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. And for all you people out there watching, remember, this is YouTube. Like and subscribe. It's your job, and I will appreciate it. Um, and with that, we'll close, and I'll see everybody in the next video. <laughs>